With companies across the country adapting to new ways of remote working, COVID-19 has increased the demand for digital. Innovative businesses are spending money on digital transformation projects to improve efficiencies, improve productivity and improve profit margins in their businesses. Today's expertise episode is going to be discussing the importance of digital in the leisure industry. And I'm pleased to be joined by Chief Executive of Tease Music Alliance, Paul Burns, and Dominic Lusardi, who is a digital guru. So it's been a turbulent year for business in the Northeast, and none more so than the leisure industry. How damaged is it and can it recover, Paul? I'll ask you first. I think in, in terms of damage, significant would be an understatement. I mean, I don't think it's damaged the point of um, complete death. It's a very resilient sector. Um, and I guess the, 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 the sort of the pathway to recovery is going to be dictated to by, uh, by the science, as they say on the telly. Recovery will be made, but it'll be a, a long one. Oh, that's good news. Uh, Don, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a shame to see all the hard work, but you've seen the resilience of the sector, and that's one thing you would say about the leisure sector is that it is resilient. It gets kicked and kicked, but it picks itself back up again. And I, I hope that we're in a position where this will actually drive new enthusiasm into the industry and actually give it a new focus as well, because I think, you know, times of challenge, actually new opportunities come out of it as well. Mm. The the first year of, of, uh, of COVID, there was an awful lot of goodwill um, and certainly behind the scenes in the industry, things like um, contractual obligations for gigs to go ahead and for performances to take place. People just kind of scrabbled together to kind of come to a, a best arrangement to allow um, events to be postponed without any financial penalties on, on either side. I don't think that's going to be the case going forward. I think um, contracts will be tightened up. And if there is another lockdown, I think you'll find that if you're tied into a contract to, to um, engage a, an artist, then the agent for that artist will say, tough, we want our money. You know, the leisure industry is about taking risks. You know, um, you know the, the game that we're in, for that to that risk to be magnified by financial uncertainty is, is something that, you know, we we kind of wait to see how that develops. So at Sapir, we've taken a proactive approach to helping in businesses in the leisure industry, and none more so than, than yourself, Paul, at Tease Music Alliance, helping you create a bespoke solution. Can you talk us through that process, the benefits of that solution, and how it's going to help the Alliance? Right at the outset of lockdown one, we realised that... Um, when the end eventually came, um, there was still going to be um, uh, restrictions. There was still going to be reluctance on the part of paying customers actually to come back into a dark and sweaty room full of 300 people. Uh, we knew the demand was still going to be there for people to um, consume the music that was on our stages. So we, we looked to take a leaf out of the sporting world where um, pay-per-view events are, are you know, pretty standard nowadays. We, we did some kind of initial hunting around and there just didn't seem to be anything that was suitable for promoters of our size. So we were looking for a solution that would allow us to um, uh, stream events, but put a paywall in um, to, to allow uh, us to, to sell them basically as, as online tickets. And, and obviously we, we started a conversation with yourselves um, which is, uh, you know, a year down the line, we, we're just about to go into uh, into production, so to speak. But we've 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 got that solution, and we're pretty confident that we will be able to mitigate for some of the lost ticket revenue that we will inevitably experience. We don't think that on the day that we're allowed to have 300 people back in our venue, that we will see many crowds of 300 people come through the doors. Certainly in the early months, possibly even the early years, until until confidence is built back up. That actually goes a long way to being able to satisfy the needs of people who, for whatever reason, haven't been able to get a ticket to a live event, which is kind of beyond COVID really, you know. So once we're back to normal, hopefully um, it, it serves serves a twin purpose. At the moment, if you wanted a, um, a, a ticket to physically sit in our venue, you come to our online box office, you uh, click on a couple of buttons, put your credit card details in, and a ticket would be emailed to you, which you then print off or show on your phone, and you turn up on the night and, and we let you in. It's almost exactly the same process for the pay-per-view. You go, go through our website. However, there will be now an option for um, buy a stream ticket. 
that then takes us through to the pay-per-view um, payment gateway that you've designed for us. Your software provides a secure um, password, uh, secure link, whatever you want to call it. As soon as the first person clicks on the link and starts to starts to see the show, uh, that's it. The, the link can't be used anymore. That could be on a tablet, it could be on a phone, you could be sat um, the other side of the world watching their brother or sister perform in a, in a gig, you know, so that the applications are, are, are more broad than we initially thought. It also allows you to take the equipment outside as well, doesn't it, to, to record in any venue, really? It does, yeah. So we, the, the, the only limitation we've got are um, signal strengths, really. We can, we can stream in HD um, from, from anywhere, really. Yeah, it, it, lots of flexibility for, for events. Brilliant, thanks for that. Anything you want to add to that, Dom? It's such a great story, isn't it, though? That, you know, yeah. The real power of that digital transformation mm. is just that massive increase in audience reach and the increase, hopefully, in profitability in the long term from yes. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you touched on it at the start of this uh, question, Paul, about the cost of the off-the-shelf platform and the rigidity of them and the fact that we built you a bespoke platform that fits exactly the needs of the Alliance. And it's also opened up different benefits that nobody really appreciated. Uh, and I'd just like to touch on that and summarise that th this doesn't need to cost the earth because it hasn't. This has been a really cost effective solution uh, for the Alliance and it's going to allow you to grow beyond what an off the shelf solution probably would have done. To help support some of these bespoke solutions, there is funding out there. We're not going to touch on it in too much detail today, but I'd just like to mention that there are funds out there to help organisations in the leisure industry and other industries to help to improve the digital uh, opportunities that this brings. And there's things like um, Tees Valley Combined Authority funding. There is funding from Growth Spark Fund that Teesside University uh, offer. So I just wanted to touch briefly on that, that there is help out there to make this thing happen. So yeah, I, mean, I, th I think one of the great benefits of uh, uh, the funding that's available beyond you know, uh, enabling uh, excellent organisations like yourself to kind of work with superior is that kind of networking element, is that touching the network, where is, you know, where is everybody else, how is it developing at that point, it's kind of a good mm -hmm. opportunity that kind of opens your mind up I think to more of the opportunities that are there as well. We've we've always had a, a good solid network uh, of of contacts within the within the funding world. Strangely though, with with this particular project, it was a whole new network that opened up um, specifically because of of COVID nineteen. So a lot of the funding that we've been able to tap into has been emergency funding around um, making sure that that um, you know businesses survive the pandemic and, and the lockdowns. We took a, a twin track approach to it and we, we accessed funding that would allow us to run the day to day. Um, but we also scouted around for specific project funding that would allow us to do things like the pay per view, which we saw as being something that, that needed to be around post the, uh, the immediacy of, the, of, the, of whichever lockdown we were in at the time. But yeah, it is, it, that. that that network of people that are kind of all of a sudden exposed to us has been very useful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The daunting prospect of having a piece of bespoke software written for us and, and a, a system put in place, we were quite quickly able to kind of uh, take our hands down from our face and open our eyes again. Um, and it wasn't as horrifying as we thought. The process was, was fairly simple, but importantly to an organisation of, of our kind of um, makeup and, and background. It wasn't costing the earth. It was a, a very reasonable set of costs that, that, uh, that we were presented with. And it, it, it was a no brainer that, you know, we, we could find um, that money. The, the cost of the solution, actually, um, in terms of the, of the whole package, um, is one of the more modest parts of, 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 the, of the package. There's always a bigger, fancier camera with, uh, with more lights on. But what we were trying to do was, was have a a professional kind of tech end, but that was that didn't involve us having to bring a, a whole cohort of directors and and camera operators. But yeah, the the the, the costs of the of the bespoke element of it were was a, a a lot more reasonable than we we ever anticipated. I think that the most complex part of this was the initial consultancy to work out you know how can we do this in an innovative way because the old way was heavily reliant on complex high-end PCs and lots of hardware and, and sound boards and things like that, whereas this solution is very lean. 
you really only needed a mobile phone essentially to plug mm. things into cameras and, and microphones and then the rest of it's taken care of by software so it's a very lean solution which is good in this day and age if you can do that at a, a very low cost the next challenge for you is uh how do we sell our beer to people that uh, are sitting at home watching it? You know, so that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's just need a few drones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> drones, of course. Yeah, that's, it. that's the future. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. The way we interact with customers and the way customers interact with us has obviously changed as a result of COVID. How do you see that affecting your industry, Paul? I think we've been quite fortunate in as much as we we weren't averse to digital solutions beforehand. So when we first uh, started doing ticketed events, if you wanted a ticket to, to one of our gigs, you came down to our building and you bought a, a paper ticket with, with cash. Over the last four or five years, we've moved completely away from that to the point actually where um, you can only buy a ticket from us using an online system. You know, So that, that's, that's been in place for, for some time. This next step is, is kind of uh, closely linked to that, um, but never before have we been in a position that on the face of it looks like we are discouraging people from coming over our doorstep there will be a natural reticence i think i think people um have, have naturally been weaned off congregating uh in in large numbers so that's going to take time to organically rebuild and, and again the, the concept of um i fancy watching a gig i won't i won't buy a ticket and go down and watch it i will um, buy a ticket and watch it on my phone or watch it on my um, uh, device cast into my widescreen television that that's th there's going to be more of a culture shock I think really than um, than, than the actual um, uh, move to an entirely digital um, frame of mind we're looking at a, a much broader portfolio now that, that includes um, a lot more community based activities we, we are a, essentially a community organization so getting involved with activities that that um, rebuild people's well-being, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are going to be as equally important going forward as as the as the live music in terms of what we offer as an organisation. But there's no doubt, without the online uh, pay-per-view solution, we would lose a, a whole tranche of our audience that that just wouldn't feel comfortable coming down. I think it's it's so important to have those kind of tools in place. I mean, the leisure industry is probably been the hardest hit just because mm. of the economics that sit behind the industry you know an organization like yourself is you know, you've got your running costs but then you've got your operating costs you've got your staff in there and all yeah. of that and it's this kind of you know, idea around digital transformation it becomes that enabler from organizations give them that little bit more safety as we get back to our new normal or whatever it is going to be but you know, for a while, the, the two industries have been trying to see where they marry together. And in actual mm. fact, it's not about necessarily just using technology in there, but it's also using the learning and that approach of how you, you operate a business in there. And I think that's been the, the great thing that I've seen over this as well. There's been so many challenges here to actually start to see this conversation open up rather than, it, you know, we need to have this conversation. Actually, it's started to happen, which is one of the great things about it. Yeah, definitely. So, Dom, this is pretty much specific to you. Most of these projects fall under the umbrella of digital transformation. In your own words, please tell us what that term means and the benefits of such. I think the word digital transformation is used quite broadly, but we've actually seen it really implemented well over the last year, you know, as far as organizations uh, uh, like yourself that have started to embrace the opportunities that can bring around. I think, you know, from a kind of wider aspect, what does it bring? Well, it brings productivity. It, increases reach and ultimately should increase profitability. You know, we've spoken about the challenges that have happened in the industry. We've spoken about how it's not just going to be around the things that you do, but the people you involve. It stops people thinking that very much locally and all of a sudden actually, what is my product and how can I grow it and take it around the world? All of a sudden digital becomes an enabler rather than necessarily a transformer. It just enables their message to be get wider impact, uh, greater impact with people and actually understand the benefits of applying digital in the business. It's not about replacing the business with digital, it's about marrying the two of them together and creating a new model. Mm. Is there more to be done, do you think, to get the message out there about funding to facilitate that, what the benef individual benefits are to their organisation, do you think there's more work to be done on that front? The beauty of what we're starting to see in this uh, uh, last year is people have had the opportunity to take a bit of a step back um, you know, it's hard to do digital transformation when you've just got to do your day-to-day. -day. 
Mm. But when you look back at the business and you understand what it is you're trying to achieve, the customer base that you're trying to attach, then all of a sudden you can start to marry the two of them together and not being necessarily led by digital, but enabled by digital. And I think that is the key that we're beginning to see ourselves is it's not a, it's not this bolt on on the side. It's actually, it's a thought pattern that can take your business forward into new, new avenues and new areas. From within the leisure industries, if somebody says we want you to digitally transform, that would frighten the pants off most uh, leisure businesses. But if you if you if you look at um, some of the steps that we've taken, even in the last year, and then uh, a little bit further back, last five six years, I talked earlier on about our um, you know our, our box office moving from a physical ticket situation to an online. That's a that's a form of digital transformation. You know, I, I was also joking about being able to sell beer digitally. Well, we are doing that. We've got um, a phone app that's linked to our till, so that when people come in uh, for socially distanced gigs, they sit down at their table. They get the phone out, they tap in um, whatever they want to drink, and lo and behold, somebody appears next year, um, five minutes later, having already taken your payment off your digitally um, with your digital drinks. It just kind of wets my whistle a bit more as to, well, what else can we do digitally, you know? And I think sometimes we, we do get bogged down in the, the, the phraseology and the terminology. When you, when you unpick all the nuts and bolts, um, it's just about using accessible tools uh, to, to, to make things easier. So I'm going to have to read my card on this one, and this is addressed to both of you. The World Economic Forum has predicted the value added by digital transformation across all industries could be greater than $100 billion by 2025. Can you tell us more about how the tech industry is enabling this on the Tees Valley? Well, I think we're at a really interesting time in the Tees Valley with what's happening as far as the developments, the investments, uh, only just recently we've heard about the free ports, we've heard about the treasury coming here, and that isn't happening by accident, that's happening because there is a movement, there is a, a process that has been recognised nationally uh, around the tech cluster and around the opportunities that are enabling here. You know, we've got quite a lot of latent industries as far as process and chemical, sure, and actually they sit and marry very well with digital and tech. It's a great opportunity uh, going forward with Teesside, but I see it as very much a future opportunity, not just you know, the now, but going forward, you know, from a logistics, borders point of view, you know, energy production, all of that. It's a really interesting time, but you know, I wouldn't say we're done. I'd say we're, we're, we're only just getting going. Yeah, exciting times though. Absolutely. Paul, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, w I would agree with, with all of that. I mean, my hopes as well is that we can underpin that kind of growth and, and those aspirations with, with some more of the, the kind of mundane issues like um, solving the local transport. We've got a conurbation of, of, you know, over half a million people. If we were a, a city of this scale, you know, the, the, the integrated transport would, would be much more able to move people from, you know, between Hartlepool and Redcar and Stockton and Darling, etc. But we rely on people physically being able to get to our events. The other thing as well that, that I would, you know, hope comes out of this is that um, we're also able to talk to each other and, and promote things. It would be would be nice to think that we could almost come up with a conurbation wide digital um, communications strategy that, that we were much more easily able to to talk to people within the conurbation and people outside, of course. But I think if we can encourage ourselves to support what's going on, that that bodes uh, very well for the future. It's kind of the crucial element in there is we can be engaged around digital transformation, but if we don't have the infrastructure, you know, mm -hmm. as you say, to deliver on that, then you know we're, we're just playing lip service to it. But you can see the serious movements that are happening. You know, they move to uh, a gigabit network, the adoption of 5G. We're enabling the area to grow, you know, and it has that great opportunity. That's always been the key thing is, you know, companies like ourselves can push against the grain as much as possible. But if you don't have those basic elements in place, you know, mm. transport, infrastructure communications, then, you know, we're, we're always going to be that bit behind. So now it's great to see that what's happened over the last year is that the area has got so much opportunity going forward. As we hopefully emerge out of this pandemic and lockdown, investing in digital transformation projects should still be high on the agenda of businesses. But specifically, how will tech firms help the leisure industry? I'm going to ask you that first, Paul. 
I think it, it would be a, a, a magnification of what we've seen over the last year, I think. Those of us that were moving towards digital solutions have had um, things accelerated over the last year. Those of us that perhaps weren't looking at digital solutions are now looking at digital solutions because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. I think when, when, when we talk about digitising the, the leisure industry, um, a lot of people think that it can't be done because what we what we provide is a very analogue uh, kind of offer. It's real people on a real stage. But actually, it's we, we're not losing any of that. It's just about how do we use digital to expand on that and, and, and um, get the content in front of more people um, using using digital means. How do we how do we use digital to enhance our marketing? How do we use digital to enhance our sales? Having digital tickets to make it easier to to get you through the front door in the first place. So it's 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 more about the the supporting tools and the the means to engage with with more people rather than the actual thing that we do itself. As you say, it's not about digital coming in and saying do your business differently, it's more about how does digital enable you to do exactly what you're doing in your business yes. as well. Yeah. And that hopefully is starting to see that those barriers have broken down now and the leisure industry can actually start to see the opportunities that it's not about bringing digital in to say you, what you're doing is wrong. It's actually to come in and go, right, how can digital echo that noise? How can it you know, make sure that that principle is taken forward? And we'll see uh, that kind of continue and uh, kind of more uh, marrying of those ways and uh, an embracing of what can digital bring to uh, organizations mm. like yourself yeah mm. excellent so the fun part of the uh, episode then the features questions first one what was your first digital gadget first digital gadget paul i would say it would have to be one of those pong machines that you plugged into the back of your telly and did the beep, beep, playing tennis or uh, slightly smaller bats playing football. It was all the same thing. It was just batting yeah. a square pixel across the screen. But uh, oh, it classes entertainment in those days. Yeah, happier times. Dom, same uh, question. I think it's the, the Tommy Tron. You know, the thing that you held up to your head and you put your eyes and you know, they kind of looked like binoculars. Yep. And you, were, you had three places that you could go. And I think it was either a shark or a car that you were doing. But yeah. I remember playing that and thinking, I'm going to get to the end of this level and I'm eventually going to get around this corner and it's going to be brilliant. Yeah. And without ever realising I was just doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. But yeah, I left that. <laughs> it was a good thing. Oh, awesome. The second one, what was the greatest digital innovation to date and why? It's a boring answer, but it's probably the calculator. The only reason why is the calculator is the root of computing. Yeah. If, we, if we didn't have the calculator, we would have never invented the computer. So for me... Yeah, my boring, boring world would be the total geek and valves and everything else. I'd probably say the calculator. That's a good answer. I like Thank it. You. Same question to you, Paul. I would think in everyday use, uh, the smartphone has got to be, you know, the, the the single most the amount of usage it gets and the sheer amount of things you can do with it. I mean, it's there's more technology in a smartphone than there was in the entire Apollo moon landing program, I believe. You know, so um, I would say that's that's got to be a up there somewhere, I think. Yeah, I think I'd agree with you. Sticking with you, Paul, then, if you could bring one technical gadget back that no longer exists, and why, what would that be, Paul? I'm, I'm struggling to think of, of any that have gone away, um, and, and I certainly wouldn't be um, breaking my neck to bring Pong back. No, I, I, honestly, I'm scratching my head to think of, of something that's gone away to, to, to bring back, really, you know, so. It's a tough question, that one, isn't it? Because yeah, you can get yeah. those Pong games anyway. On yeah, your phone, you can get on your phone. that's right, yeah. 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 I'm going to give you a total geeky answer, but storage. You know, we've got to this point where all of a sudden we used to have terabytes worth of storage on our laptops and we'd be able to do it. Now we're being sold laptops that have got 256 gig and you run out of them because the operating system takes 200 gig. Yeah. So therefore you're paying more money to have an online subscription to somewhere that you don't know, that you can't then access when you don't have an internet connection. So really boring, but just cost effective storage locally for your devices so that you're enabled to do what you want to do rather than paying Apple or Google any more money for what they want to do. Last couple of questions then, explain the internet to an alien. Quite hard one because I don't know what I'm talking about. I would say like basically like a very well indexed filing cabinet full of mostly rubbish. Yeah. But you can get to the thing that you want quite quickly rather than having to finger through loads of rubbish. So yeah, that's probably the way I would describe it. It's just a very complex filing cabinet that's easy to access. Yeah. Good explanation. 
Paul? Uh, yeah, you couldn't couldn't better that really, is it? It is, it is a, a big filing cabinet. And probably the only elaboration would be that instead of uh, only being able to open the drawers from the front, you can actually open the drawers from all sides, upside down, any, any dimension that we're in really, yeah. And last question, Paul. What's your most used app? Um, I would say it would have to be my email app on me on my phone, closely followed by um, you know one of several newspaper apps that I have. Yeah, terrible admission, but I, I don't buy newspapers like a lot of people anymore. No. I uh, I access all my news from from a range of different apps on my phone. Then I'll jump onto Twitter. Uh, then I'll jump onto Facebook, and then check my emails and out for the day. Same question to you, Dom. Most used app? I'm going to give you a really geeky answer. It's the web browser. Personally, I've made a move to stop using apps and to start using the web because that is the most democratized way of developing, uh, delivering data and information. It's it's the same for everybody. But then I would go completely against that and say probably the fitness app is my second version, uh, <laughs> one because I've just been trying to really get into understanding you know, myself as a human human being and you know, how I operate on a daily basis as well. And I found that really fascinating. Well, look, that brings us to the end of the expertise session. Thank you very much for your time, Paul, um, Chief Executive of Tease Music Alliance. Really appreciate your time. And Dominic Lusardi, appreciate your time as the technical guru in the room. You're thank welcome. you very much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yep, thank you. Sophia Software have been helping in excess of 30 businesses improve their digital landscape through the Digital Transformation Project. We'd love to speak to other businesses that would like to engage uh, with digital transformation but don't really know how to go about it. Um, our details will be at the end of this video. Please get in touch. We'd love to help.